So welcome everyone to another SOL seminar online. Today I'm glad to introduce Peter Wilf in this seminar this Friday. And Peter Wilf is a professor of geosciences at Penn State University. After spending his 20s as a teacher and musician in West Philadelphia, he discovered his love of paleontology about age 30 and became a graduate student in geology at the University of Pennsylvania. Most of Peter's thesis research was done in residence at the Smithsonian and, the, and in the field in Wyoming on floristic of paleoclimatic change across the Paleocene Eocene boundary. During this time and in an ensuing Smithsonian postdoc, he began developing two major themes of his subsequent research, the fossil history of plant insect associations and the remarkable reaches of Patagonian fossil floras. Peter spent three years at Michigan, 1999 to 2002, as a Michigan fellow and joined the Penn State Geosciences faculty in 2002, where ever since he has been developing these and several other research projects with the students and colleagues all over the world. Peter's honors include a David and Lucille Packard Fellowship, Fellow of the Geological Society of America, Fellow and Distinguished Lecturer of the Paleontological Society, and the George Atherton Award for Excellence in Teaching from Penn State University. And today he's going to talk about the Latin fruits of Gondwana. So with that, I let uh, Peter share the screen. Perfect. Peter, you're muted, just so you know. Yes. Peter, we cannot hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, good, good to see all of you out in the in the virtual universe. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm Peter Wilf, I'm a paleobotanist. So I'm, I'm here today to tell you uh, really why I love my job so much, but um, the, <laughs> one of the most uh, fun discoveries that we made recently was um, fossil tomatillos from Gondwana in Argentina. So I'm here today uh, just as a literally a card carrying geologist, um, just to give you a perspective um, that might be a little different for some of you on uh, and, and help you understand uh, where these fossils come from in the world and in the history of climate, in the history of plants. Um, you know, what in the world happened? Why do we have these? Uh, why do we have these amazing fossils? Um, so, you know, this this picture shows sort of a miniature of the whole talk. You can see little tomatillos, and they're floating into this ancient volcanic lake, uh, and they sink, and they get entrapped in sediment. And 52 million years later, paleontologists come along and split a rock and find them again as fossils and expose them to the light again. So we have a Solanaceae crowd. I'm just going to jump right into Solanaceae. Usually you have to introduce Solanaceae, but not with you folks. Um, so the Solanaceae fossil record is, is really poor. Um, and this is, this is a widespread issue with any kind of, uh, any kind of uh, organism that's not common and doesn't have, um, doesn't have a lot of biomass either. We have herbaceous plants that have uh, much less biomass than, uh, than the large trees that they can grow under. So it's not surprising that there are very few fossils. Um, until the events of this talk that many of you are already familiar with, there, there were no valid fossil fruits of Solanaceae. There's still no fossil uh, flowers or leaves. Um, Mian and Crepe, for example, surveyed all the possible flower records of Solanaceae and decided that none of them actually represented Solanaceae. Uh, Tina Sarkin and Al, Sarkin and Al in 2013 uh, revalidated a whole lot of uh, Eocene to uh, Neogene isolated seeds um, as Solanaceae. Um, so very small fossils, but very important records. Um, but they did, these don't seem to really represent any derived groups except the really large clade uh, Solanoidae. Oops. Consequently, Solanaceae evolution is very poorly calibrated in time and space. Um, no fossil evidence had addressed these and other significant ideas that South America was the area of Solanaceae origin and early diversification. And the idea from a molecular um, dating estimates that uh, the crown of Solanaceae 
um, radiated on post-Gondwan in South America when it was isolated, and that a lot of the and the Solanaceae colonized the world subsequently through transoceanic dispersal. So, so some really important ideas um, that we can look try to look to the fossil record to address. So now I'm going to shift your attention to uh, to the Earth history side. I'm going to be flipping back and forth on you constantly. So I want you to think about the world 50 million years ago, and the place we work um, is is there on that Eocene world. Uh, so there are two, there are sort of two things here. There's Gondwana and there's the hot house. So you know, starting with um, Gondwana, uh, Gondwana is actually a, a, a very was a very ancient and long lived future of the Earth. Um, it formed about 700 million years ago. So you know, even before multicellular animals probably existed. And at one time, it consisted uh, not only of South America, Australia and Antarctica, but also of India with Madagascar, Africa, uh, New Zealand, um, and um, I'm sure I, I'm sure I'm leaving out one on this memory test. But the, uh, the, the, even 50 million years ago, the, the very, very end of Gondwana was still South America, Antarctica, and Australia. And after this time, we get the separation of, of these continents from, uh, from Antarctica, the development of the uh, Antarctic circumpolar current, uh, glaciation, and just sort of a very different world. Uh, but 50 million years ago, um, India had just docked with Asia, which is another pretty interesting story. Africa was long gone from Gondwana. There was no, um, th th there was no land route between North and South America, not, not really until about 3 million years ago did that happen. And oh, another very important thing that happens after this time is that Australia moves north. So there's a warm um, rainforest biome that probably extended from Patagonia across a lot of Antarctica into Southern Australia, where there are lots of fossils also representing this. And Australia became sort of a life raft carrying the survivors of, of this ancient rainforest biome um, and, and moving north, colliding with Asia and dispersing them into the Oceanic Islands and actually into and, and pushing up New Guinea as it moved north. And so a lot of the lineages that, that, that we find um, in Australia, Antarctica, and as I'm gonna show you in Patagonia, uh, survive today in places like the mountains of New Guinea and um, uh, the mountains of Northern Borneo. Uh, and some of them have even made their way into uh, Asia mainland. So the, the Gondwanan history of the Asian rainforest is actually very, very rich. And it's sort of into all, all this context um, that I'm going to take you, I'm going to show you where these uh, little fossil tomatillos fit. Um, but this was also the last time the earth was really warm. So the, the poles were forested. There were uh, dawn redwood forests across the, um, in, in the Arctic. Little primates, the first primates and horses dispersed between North America, Asia, and Europe. And what we're starting to see is um, more and more evidence for a southern dispersal across the, across the warm poles there as well. Um, so this is sort of the last sort of outpost of the Mesozoic, uh, very warm climate, after which climate cools pretty much until the present day. And just sort of a close up with apologies to uh, Gustav Klimt for Goodbye Gondwana, The Last Kiss. So, you know, this is a, a geophysical reconstruction showing that the tip of Antarctica and the, and the tip of South America were adjacent and only shallow water separated them. So this was no doubt by a geographic barrier of any consequence. And we see plenty of evidence for this with plants um, and, and mammals um, as well. So I'm going to zoom out uh, in a different way. And I just want to acknowledge that this, everything I'm showing you today is part of a much larger project that we call the Patagonia Paleoflores Project, which is focusing on uh, Patagonian fossil plants through Earth history, especially from the end of the Cretaceous to the middle of the Eocene. This project has been running for about 20 years as an incredibly successful collaboration between Argentina and the US and, and many other countries. Um, and sort of the PIs all the way through, but myself, Alejandra Gandolfo, Cornell, and Ruben Cunio is the director of the MEF Museum, which is a very important uh, museum in Patagonia that is the repository of our fossils and the source of many of our collaborators. And we've just had a long list of uh, students and collaborators who've uh, worked with us uh, over the years um, and um, really about 20 years now. 
And I'm proud to say that all these people have produced more than 150 peer reviewed papers now. So it's, uh, it's, 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 really been, it's really been a great ride. Um, today's talk in particular includes the efforts of these folks, in addition to myself, Alejandro Gandolfo, Ruben Cunio, um, Monica Carvalho, who's now at Stry, and uh, Rocio, who introduced me. Thank you, Rocio. Um, and you can follow the project. Um, I have a question. Yes. Who has a question? Okay, I don't hear any audio, so I will keep going. Uh, it's better to have the questions at the end. It's fine. I don't mind. If, if, it's, if it's not particularly um, urgent, we can wait till the end. So yeah, so we have a Google Scholar page. You can follow the, uh, the project and all the publications. We're sending a whole lot of fossil floras in Patagonia and their responses to the, the dinosaur extinction event and um, warming and cooling events and the separation from Antarctica. So the whole project, we're looking at maybe 600 species of fossil plants and 20,000 specimens, of, of which we have three specimens <laughs> that are uh, Solanaceae. So there's really just a lot to look at. Um, so we have uh, latest, late, latest Cretaceous coastal lowlands, um, the Colonia and Lefipan flores that represent the very end of the age of dinosaurs. And we could compare them to uh, fossil plants and animals from just after the dinosaur extinction from the Salamanca formation and the Las Flores flora. And then we get into a system of Eocene caldera lakes. Um, and those include um, uh, Laguna de Lunco, which is going to be the focus today, another site that's a little younger called Rio de Chileafu. And I sort of want to you know, give you my, uh, be a little bit of a geology professor today and uh, tell you tell you some of the tools of the trade. The, the most, one, of the, one of the most important things we could do, second only to finding the fossils, is to date the rocks, right? So, um, so we date the rocks using minerals um, that are deposited in volcanic eruptions. So this white layer on a hill that we found had been overlooked um, is actually a volcanic ash layer from a volcanic eruption 61.984 plus or minus 0 0.041 million years ago. And so that's a highly resolved analytical age uh, from zircon crystals that are embedded in this ash whose clock started at the time of the volcanic eruption. Um, and that's been our best tool all along. A lot of these sites were new to begin with, or if they had been historically known, had never been well dated. And we've really developed an eye for finding the volcanic ashes and getting really good dates from them. Um, and that's made a huge difference. As we say in geology, no dates, no rates. You can't put anything on the time scale without an, a geological age, a fossil really means almost nothing. So um, anyway, moving on from that, I'm gonna take you to Trileo. A little, um, this little city in, um, in Patagonia, Argentina, located here. And this is our base of operations because um, the, the, there's a museum there, the MEF Museum, fairly new museum, extremely dynamic. That's been our main partner uh, through all of this um, and, is even, and is also the repository for our fossils and the source of a lot of our collaborators. And with this fantastic museum in Patagonia, there is ready access to an enormous number of incredible fossil sites, dinosaur sites, mammal sites, lots of fossil uh, plant sites, and you know the Mesozoic, the Paleozoic. So it's really just incredible riches right here in the Chibut Valley. And um, the town of Trile was founded by uh, Welsh settlers in 1865. This is the in, this is the uh, centennial stone. And this is the MEF Museum, which stands for uh, Museo Paleontologico Ejidio Ferruglio. And there it is. Um, so this, is, this museum is such a success story. It started really with a vision and a small space, really about the size maybe of a, of a big Dunkin' Donuts, maybe no larger than that. And in 1997, the new MEF was built, which you see here. And now there's a huge expansion. The MEF is now tripling in size. So it's just been tremendous in terms of uh, public education, exhibits, cultural life in the area, and of course science, and just a whole lot of amazing discoveries through field work. Um, so when you walk in the MEF, you see dinosaur bones everywhere. So these are individual vertebrae of the largest animal that ever lived on land, Patagonia Titan. Where do you put them anyway? Oh, and here's the field operation. Here we are about to head out. Here's Rocio looking in the lab at fossil tomatillas. Here's the incredible prep lab. There's one of my former students, Mike Donovan, happily at work. Um, 
one of the best prep labs in the world, actually. They're always preparing just incredible pieces of dinosaurs um, and, of course, uh, fossil plants. So it's just a terrific place for uh, students to work. It's really just perfect. So just as a little sideline, um, back in about uh, 2012, 2013, um, a rancher called the MEF, um, and they had right, they had found a, a piece of a big bone. And you know, to make a long story short, this turned out to be a, a dinosaur graveyard from the early Cretaceous that contained more than seven, at least seven individuals of the largest sauropod that ever walked on the earth. This is just one femur. Compare that to your own femur, right? So. Um, so these animals were, uh, were uh, excavated with immense effort, um, but it really paid off. Not only was there a David Attenborough special and a lot of science, uh, one of the authors of the paper was commended by the Argentine legislature. And now uh, this dinosaur um, is met, has a whole room in the American Museum of Natural History in New York. It has the rotunda of the Field Museum. Um, so it's appearing all over the world, uh, the world's largest dinosaur from the early Cretaceous. And even when you land in Trileo, there is a full-scale model standing in the step uh, to greet you. And for those who don't know me, I'm over two meters tall. So <laughs> that's a really big dinosaur. One of the things that doesn't come, come across on Zoom. Now this area, of course, is full of wonderful wildlife. I can't keep talking about that, but you know, lots of Quadacos and some of the stars of the wildlife, the, uh, the, the penguinos, the uh, Magellanic penguins, the uh, breeding colony. Uh, Punatumbo is a spectacular site. And of course, the southern right whales um, are easily seen um, right near the MEF, within a quick drive of the MEF, right on the beach. This picture was taken from the beach. Okay, so I'm gonna now sort of focus in on the site that produced the fossil tomatillas, and it's called Laguna do Unco, um, or literally Lake of Reeds. Um, and that, that's, that's, that is the, the correct local spelling with the H. Um, and if you kind of look at this National Geographic image, here's, here's Trileo with the MEF, so you can see that this is about a nine hour drive to get to camp up the Chibut Valley through spectacular rocks. Um, so if you look at the site, it's in the modern day steppe. But of course you have the, on the other side of the Andes and the other side of the rain shadow, um, we, have the, um, we have the Valdivian rainforest. They have some of the most, the wettest places on earth but right here where we're collecting, it's pretty dry. So, and so we're collecting um, in a modern day, almost desert, we're collecting a fossil rainforest next to a modern day temperate rainforest that seems to have almost nothing to do with the fossil rainforest. They seem to have almost nothing in common, floristically. Uh, and you have to remember the Andes, the modern version of the Andes is only about 15 million years old. There have been previous uplifts, um, but, um, this this big rain shadow future is not is is much much younger than the fossils that we're um, collecting. And just for a quick jump to Solanaceae, some of you might be starving uh, for that. Uh, Rocio, I put together this little map showing the fossil site, and um, of course the tomatillas uh, we've uh, described as uh, as different species of Physalis or Physalis, depending on which neighborhood of Philadelphia you're from. I, I'm a Physalis person. Um, but the, the modern range of Physalis or Physalis comes almost down to where the site is now, which is interesting. And the southernmost species is uh, Viscosa. But if you look at the paleogeography, the site once again at the time is, is really just connected to Antarctica. There's only shallow water separation. So, so all those connections across Gondwana are, are still going for, you know, ge in geologic terms, maybe for five more minutes, but they're still there. Um, so this is Laguna do Unco, um, and it's one of the most spectacular landscapes you could ever want to collect fossils in because it's these blazing white rocks full of fossils and then dark volcanic rocks that they're embedded in. So um, if you kind of look more closely, you can start to see the layers of rock, the individual strata, and and then you can see that the, this, this main fossiliferous outcrop is about 1.3 kilometers um, north to south. That's 1.3 kilometers of fossils. And it's also 170 meters of fossils. So there, there could be literally billions of fossil plants, insects, frogs, birds, turtles um, you know, in, in these rocks. Now what these rocks uh, represent 
Well, what happened is 52 million, a little, 52 and a half million years ago, there was an enormous uh, cult, uh, volcanic eruption and a caldera form, you know, Yellowstone Lake size. And the caldera floor sank um, and, so, and, the, uh, and filled with mud and ash and sandstone, uh, and sand, excuse me, which turned to mudstone and sandstone and tough. And volcanic ash fell into this ancient lake and fossils were preserved uh, in various ways as material entering the lake. So we have 170 meters of rock. Um, so as geologists, we measure this centimeter by centimeter and we get all the information out of it to understand the ancient environment. And we even flew a, uh, a drone there just once, the wind is so high. This is a Liz Hajek, Marcelo Krauss. Uh, you can get a look at just this, this is just part of the section. So you can see why after 20 years, we're not even nearly done. There's so much rock um, and there's views down this way. And actually the Caldera Basin is about 30 kilometers north to south. So this is just one piece of it, although it seems to be the most fossiliferous part. And there are fossils up the hill. There's fossil wood lying on the slopes. Of course, there's the little access road. Uh, that's our commute. So uh, you'll see some uh, drawings in here by uh, my, my incredibly talented spouse, Rebecca. We're uh, uh, writing together a children's book about so the story that I'm telling you today, which is probably a more appealing way to hear the story. So this is a, this is a restoration of the ancient lake. Um, so if you imagine, it kind of looks more like Sumatra or the Philippines, this big volcanic lake um, surrounded by lush rainforest and volcanoes. And the volcanoes are going off all the time. And various mechanisms are getting fossils into the lake, uh, flush from the rivers, um, uh, slope failures of the surrounding vegetation, blasts from the volcanoes. So my colleague here, uh, Liz Hajek, is interpreting these different factors and is coming up with an interpretation of how the fossils got into the lake. Um, but it's very important to realize volcanoes are going off all the time and they are spewing these special crystals into the lake that can be dated. Um, so if if this is, this is an older figure that Liz and Marcelo are going to do a big, are doing a big update on now. But here you see the 170 meters of rock. And you can see a number of things here. First of all, this is not just one site, um, but it's a lot of different holes in the ground that are at different positions. The higher up they are, the younger, the, the, the lower down, the older. Um, so as we go up and down, we go through time. So this is a consolidated diagram of several different rock faces. So you can see the relative positions and which, which, which holes in the ground are older or which ones are younger. And then you can start to see some more things. Um, so we have um, Jason Hicks back in 1999, um, got the paleomagnetic signatures from the rocks. So this is another way that we can help to date the rocks. And then we got um, argon, argon ages from sanidine crystals in the rocks. So um, I'm very interested in molecular dating. Um, I'm, I, I hope that it will, um, you know, that it will be very reliable um, at some point. But to, for a geologist, uh, the, the, the dates means this. It means geochronology uh, um, um, extracted analytically from volcanic crystals in tophaceous rocks. And of course, the molecular timescale ultimately is also derived from this because it's derived from, um, from um, calibrated, temporally calibrated fossils. Um, so ultimately, it's all, the molecular timescale is also derived from uh, from these crystals, zircons and sanidines. So the most reliable of these ages is this one because of the materials that were dated. So that's 52.22, plus or minus 0.22 million years. Um, and that date was done sort of a while ago, but we have some new uranium lead ages that are not published, but they, they totally confirm that these ages are right. We also just published last year, the underlying ignimbrite that represents the, the volcanic eruption. Um, is 52.54 plus or minus 0.17 million years. So all the fossil tomatillos are actually bracketed in, um, by those two dates. So their minimum age is 52.2, their, their maximum age is 52.5. So that's pretty tight control. And we're now getting the same result from two different analytical systems. So we can say our fossil tomatillos are incredibly well dated. You can really be secure about how old they are. They're between 52.22 and 52.54 million years old. Now, another thing that this tells us is that all these fossils, because we have this age control, we can relate this to the global uh, geologic time scale and to earth history events. 
Um, so this is the famous Zachos et al. 2001 climate curve for the Cenozoic based on oxygen isotopes from uh, foraminifera shells from deep sea cores. So you can see the whole trend of the last 70 million years. And Laguna, Laguna de Lunco was once thought to be Eocene and then thought to be Miocene. Um, it's definitely Eocene and it dates to this last period of sustained warming in Earth history, which we call the early Eocene climatic optimum. So we have records of this from all over the world, from Australia, from Europe, from North America, from Asia, uh, from the ocean, uh, showing us how the biota responded to this time. So Laguna de Loco is therefore not, is representing the end of Gondwana simultaneously with this hot house interval. And we, only because we have the geological dates and the fantastic <laughs> geophysical reconstructions of the past continents can we, can we say all that, but we do have those things. Okay, so we've brought a lot of people out in the field. So this is one field crew. And I just want to note that in this tiny little sheep shed in, uh, in Patagonia, we have uh, representation from six different countries. Um, I just want to show you what the digging is like. So a, a lot of what we do is very 19th century still. Um, we are. We have to clear off. The, we have to clear off the rocks that don't have fossils, which could be very, very heavy. One of the reasons the state, site had been so little studied, a, is very far from the capital Buenos Aires and any resources. We've solved that with a MEF. Uh, B, the rocks are just really hard. So in, in this case, in this one, we're simply shoveling off what we call the overburden. Uh, that's uh, Kirk Johnson, Moni Carvalho. Our Iglesias. So we do that for about four hours, but we also bring up electric drills just to remove this. So, so the MEF has some of the best uh, portable drills. So here we go, drilling away. So those are two of the technicians of the MEF, uh, Pablo Fuerte, just like that of site there, Leandro Canessa, and you can see other folks just splitting the rocks. And then the result of all this is sort of a dance floor, a, a clean quarry with only fossils in it. So the little pay layer, even in this whole landscape, but this particular layer of fossils is only about like six centimeters thick. So we have to extract that perfectly. So then we celebrate, as you can see. And here's some of the wonders of Laguna de Lunco. Um, uh, insects, fossil wood. Uh, birds, this bird leg was just published, incredible fossil fruits. We have over 200 species of plants from this site and over 8,000 specimens. This is Alejandro Gandolfo uh, hiking back. Um, and, and the cook came out, our camp cook came out and he never collected fossils before and found uh, on his first split, he found this enormous part and counterpart of some, of some amazing leaf, probably an arrow. We take them back to the museum uh, we use the air tools, we reveal the fossils that are hidden by the sediment, uh, we log, we make the data set, all of that stuff. Um, so at first, um, you know, at least from my perspective, I was just overwhelmed by the number of species. So sort of the first papers that I was most involved in were on this topic of high plant diversity and you know, South America, how long has it had, had high plant diversity and lots of insect damage. Um, you know, over 200 species of plants. And if you, when you adjust for sample size, this is one of the most diverse um, fossil sites in the world. And it's, it's certainly for the time period, which is already known for very high plant diversity. Um, but as we kept going, it became clear that the, as we started to figure out more and more the identities of the plants, the signals became more and more interesting. Um, so a lot of the most interesting signals actually come from conifers. So here's the Here's, this, here's the bi biogeography in a nutshell again. So you have the site and the Aus Australia life raft. So a lot of the conifers, uh, excuse me for this sudden forward there. Most, what we see in a lot of the flora is, uh, as, we, as we just mentioned, an Australasian or um, Southeast Asian connection, not really a whole lot of connection to the living floras of South America. Now, a lot of what you're seeing is a distillation of really a whole lot of papers um, that I'm going to go over pretty briefly. But a lot of these occurrences are the only occurrence of the genus or the lineage ever found in South America, just for this one site. So we have the only South American agathis. 
Um, and then I've coded these for where they live now and where and the asterisk means that, that they're fossils. For instance, in Australasia, a lot of these conifers have fossils. Now another, so we have a Papua cedrus, the only occurrence of Papua cedrus, which was in New Guinea now, many kinds of podocarps. Um, so this is sending a very strong signal of ever wet rainforest. Most, most of these plants cannot live in, uh, in seasonal drought conditions at all. And there are physiological reasons for this. Uh, so this is sending both a climatic signal and a biogeographic signal, um, which also carries over into the ferns and the angiosperms. The screen, there we go. Uh, so we start, if, if, if we add in ferns and angiosperms, we start to get some possible African signals. Um, and there's just a lot of, there are a lot of firsts here, like uh, Juglandaceae in uh, South America, Phagaceae, uh, the only ones ever found in, in Gondwana. And of course, uh, with the South American signal, uh, American signal, we have the Solanaceae, the two species of Solanaceae. So there's sort of a lot packed in there, but there, there's this, there's this very, very strong signal of Australian Southeast Asian connections and uh, ever wet rainforests. Um, so if we just look at Southeast Asia, not even, not even the Australian part, um, these are all uh, lineages that we have as fossils at Laguna de Lunco and where they live now. And there are the fossils. So that's that. So there's this again, this amazing connection we have as fossils, um, lineages that you can find, you know, in mainland Southeast Asia now, and that you can trace through space and time. So one of the many examples of this is Dacrycarpus and the in the in the podocarps. Um, but this is we we have a lot of these, uh, more than a hundred. But we have the one specimen that has eight attached seed cones with a fleshy receptacle. Um, and so there it is on the cover of American Journal of Botany. <laughs> and then like the same year that this was published, um, I went to Mount Kinabalu and <laughs> found the fossil alive. Here it is, just sitting in some water, looking pretty, but it's, it's literally almost the same thing. Um, so Dacrycarpus is bird dispersed and it now ranges into Northern Myanmar, 18,000 kilometers from the fossil sites. And then we have, um, we have the uh, agathis uh, leaves, um, Pollen cones, spectacular pollen cones, cone scales with the seeds still on them. And then we've since published a stem agathis species from the early Paleocene of Patagonia from about 64 million years ago. So we actually have both stem and crown agathis. We have a morphological clock for agathis dated with geochronology. Um, here's some beautiful pictures from some of my, my forest walks on the other side of the world, agathis lenticula on Kinopala, agathis atropurpurea on Mount Bartle Frere. And the agathis have the same insect damage um, as the fossils was from Patagonia as well. So the insect damage seems to have tracked the host. And that's something that uh, my student McDonough then uh, published last year in, uh, in comms bio. And then uh, with the angiosperms, some really famous examples. Um, Alejandra has led on the eucalyptus where we have, it's not subtle, we have hundreds of eucalyptus leaves and uh, some flowers and, and dozens of infructescences. The flowers have in situ pollen. So by far the oldest record of eucalyptus is not in Australia, but um, in uh, Argentina. So, you know, again, the Southern connection rules. And we also published um, the first Gondwan and Fagaceae, um, which are these uh, scaly cups with uh, acorns inside of them. Um, and you can see the uh, sutures, the opening, you can see the nut sticking out, you can see the scales on the, uh, on the cupule. This is a modern cuspidata from Japan. So if this is an infructescence with uh, four of the acorns and cupules on it. Um, so this actually fits very nicely in the modern genus Castanopsis, which of course is one of the dominants of Southeast Asian rainforests. We also have hundreds of figaceous leaves Nothing subtle here, and this um, spike of a, more than 110 immature fruits. Um, and they have here's a modern one with uh, styles, perianth lobes, these little tiny perianth lobes, the scaly cupule. And we can see this, these little fruits also have scaly cupule, perianth lobe, three styles, one, two, three, one, two, three, scaly cup. And even in a phylogenetic analysis, they come out in the genus Castanopsis. So that's another one. Um, so this is a passage Rebecca wrote by looking at the fossils from the lake and also her drawing. The scientists begin to understand what Laguna de Lunco was like 50 million years ago. The fossil plants are not like the plants that grow in Patagonia today. Instead, they're more closely related to plants that grow in the mountains of Australia, New Guinea, and Southeast Asia. 
So all of this is the context for these fossil tomatillas. Now, one day in 2002, at the same site on the same day, we found what became the holotype of Physalis and Finamundi, which was this 2017 paper, and the, the holotype of what became uh, Castanopsis Rothwellia in this 2019 paper. Why did it take so long? Did I mention the 8,000 fossils and the very hard rocks? I think I did. Um, so from over 8,000 plant fossils collected over 20 years, there are three specimens of two species of Physalis. Uh, Physalis Hodikinii, Phosphorus and Finamundi, shown here. And here they are in stratigraphic order. So you can see exactly where they come from in the, in the rock pile. So they're shown, so, which, so you know, they're about, all about the same age, obviously. But you can put them in the correct stratigraphic order. The principle of paleobotany is, or any paleontology, is you have to document what you collect well enough that you could put it back in the ground where you found it. Um, so we always strive for that standard. Okay. so. Uh, of course, this has, has been published for a few years, but I do want to go over the futures and make sure, uh, help you understand what these things look like fossilized. So here's um, um, Infina Mundi. So it has a long, slender pedestal. And one of the things that made this so hard to figure out was what all these little projections are. And, you know, we thought for a long time that these were these, were these um, you know, styles, were they, were they um, stamens, you know, what are these? But they're really just veins. And one, once, once I realized that, it finally all clicked together. These are just veins that are pushed up from, from compression behind the fruit. So there's no corolla here at all. <laughs> that was the realization that allowed this to all go forward. All these loose ends are compressed vein remnants. Um, so what you're seeing is the, the lantern fruit calyx, highly angled, and then it's broken, just where the rock split. Um, you can see the positive here, the negative here. Um, with the, and the black stuff is the berry. The berry has turned to coal because when you compress organic matter, that's how you get coal. Um, so that's, that's, so we have a compressed berry and you can actually trace the roundness of the berry in 3D just under, on a microscope. It's very hard to photograph this. Maybe we'll CT it someday. But you, you know, the, the, the shape is, is round. So this is a very large berry. So when, once that all fell into place, it, it, then it made sense. So you have to read, understand the preservation of the large round thick compressed colified berry exposed by cleavage inside the inflated calyx. Um, so the calyx is, uh, so at least superficially, there are a lot of similarities to angustifolia, which is sort of my favorite reference point. Um, so the calyx is highly inflated, strongly angled and lobed. The lobes are triangular, equally sized. The lobe sinuses are angular. Um, it has primary veins, one primary vein per lobe known to the tip of the lobe. Um, secondary veins that go to the sinuses and fork. And there are also intersecondary veins present and reticulate tertiary venation. Um, so the calyx space is slightly uh, invaginated or depressed at the pedestal insertion. And you can actually see the five primary veins here. Once you realize that these are, are veins, it all makes sense. They terminate in the lobe apices. And you can see four of the presumed five lobe tips. Even on an herbarium sheet, you often don't see all five lobe tips, depending on how it's squished. Um, here's a detail. You can actually see the calyx covering the colified berry. Um, and here's a primary vein. <laughs> and you can see the secondary vein bifurcating before the lobe sinus, which is a common feature of uh, Physalis, as you can see here, again, in angustifolia. Okay, now we have the second specimen, which is interesting. It shows sort of a different preservation state. It doesn't have a berry, it doesn't have a pedestal, we would never have described the species just based on this, but the venation and the lobing are the same. Um, the base is strongly uh, invaginated. The calyx is well inflated, strongly angled. And herbarium sheets, one thing I've, I look at a lot of herbarium sheets and they, they also fossilize in a way because the fossils are compressed on the sheet. So here's one that got squished um, underneath uh, a stem and it sort of mimics what you're seeing there in the fossils. Um, and here's one where you can see how the veins pop up in the back when you squish it, right? See these veins coming up? Those are the same phenomenon that you see here. This is also the same species, angustifolia. So angustifolia has the range of aspect rate, uh, ratios that we're seeing in the fossils from rounder to longer. You can see all five lobes in the specimen, so that makes it helpful. The, uh, the primary, the secondary vein forking is there, it's, but it's, it's a very narrow fork. 
Um, so we did a uh, we did a full morphological analysis. We didn't just assign these to Physalis, as has been stated in some papers I've read, just because it has an inflated calyx. Uh, that would be absurd. Um, so we did a full comparison to all the extant Solanaceae with inflated or crescent calyces um, using a lot of uh, physical herbaria, uh, online herbaria, developed an image library of almost 3,000 images. And then um, we selected 16 characters that uh, could be scored for uh, both fossils and extant material. Um, on 109 sol solanaceae species and 33 genera that have inflated or, or crescent calyces. It also had genetic data published from the Tina Sarkinen et al. paper. So we use that as a starting point. Um, these are the 16 characters. So again, not just inflated calyx, but um, a whole lot of stuff. And this, of course, builds on, um, builds on a lot of really important literature about the morphology of, uh, of solanaceae that stretches back through um, a whole number of authors. I think some of you are, are here. I think I saw Janet Sullivan's name, Sullivan's name earlier. So your, your work was very important for developing this. Uh, so from the 16 character matrix, uh, we, we did a combined uh, total evidence, um, strict, strict consensus, maximum likelihood. Um, uh, and uh, Monica Carvalho is the person who did, actually did these incredible phylogenetic analyses, um, which put the, you know, which put these uh, fossils definitely in the physaloids, not way, way down in the solenoids. Um, so there's strong morphological evidence if you just do the standard taxonomy and even if you do the phylogenetic analysis, um, that these really are, if not the genus physalis, um, certainly um, very derived solanaceae in, in, the, in the larger tribe of physalidae. Okay, now the picture got even richer um, a few years ago. When, um, when we went back to Laguna de Lunco and we found a new site um, and it had a second species of tomatillo. Can you guys, oh yeah, there we go. I happened to have this on loan from Argentina. Here it is. And we're gonna be cat scanning it for the seeds. So here I'm holding a fossil of tomatillo right now in, in, in real time that's on my desk on loan from Argentina that we found. And uh, I called up Rocio to come and look at it. And as I was looking at it, I realized that this was not just another specimen of Infina mundi, that the venation was really different and we really might have a second species. So here it is. Um, Rocio named it Faisalis uh, Hunikinii in honor of Mario Hunikin, who's a famous um, uh, pale paleobotanist who, from Cordoba, the same university where Rocio is now. So it's a really terrific uh, honor for uh, Dr. Hunnikin. And so, he, so here it is, part and counterpart with an indeterminate dicot leaf underneath it. And you can see sort of the same patterns. There's a break in the kale. There's a very nice pedestal. You can see it flaring. Um, you can see all five lobes and you can see the colified berry. It has some sort of whitish mineral inclusion from uh, the volcanic fluids that circulated through these rocks. So you always have to keep the geology in mind. Um, you can see the five lobe tips. You can kind of see where there's a break, where things are broken. It's a fossil after all. But you can off, maybe you can start to see these horizontal lines are veins. So there's very, very dense tertiary uh, venation connecting the primary and secondary veins to each other. It's completely different from Infina Mundi. Um, here are uh, Rocio's um, drawings of uh, Huenikinii on the top. And Fina Mundi on the bottom. It was just incredible that these both come from the same little area. Um, and this one, <laughs> they both come from Laguna de Lunco, where those pictures are. Um, in fact, the, the, my, my background, if you see my background, that's a view of Laguna de Lunco. And I'm actually right at the locality, I'm standing right between the type locality of Infina Mundi and Huene That's like That's literally where my head is in the view of me that you see. So they come from there. Um, but you can see there's differences in the aspect ratio, the narrower lobes in Hunikinii, but what's really convincing is we have random reticulate predation in, in Fina Mundi, which means at the end of the world, which is appropriate for Patagonia. Um, it's always called the end of the world, El Fin del Mundo, and the, um, and the transverse veins that are very, very dense in Hunikinii. So these really are two different species surrounding the same old lake. So, you know, the, the two papers on these two species are full of these analyses. The pedestal is longer than 15 millimeters, 
only five secondary veins emerge from the calyx base, mainly transverse tertiary veins, that gets you to Duprea and Physalis already. And then long, narrow lobes don't occur in Duprea. So that would put this in Physalis. Um, so, yeah, so what does all this mean? Well, I mean, one, one, thing, that's, one thing that's obvious is that, um, you know, fossils give us the time scale of evolution, right? So the, we're finding over and over as we hit this generally, um, you know, generally undersampled compared to say North America and Europe, part of the world, which is, uh, which is Southern South America. And we're making a lot of discoveries of things that um, no one knew were there. And we're also finding that they're a lot older than they were thought to be. And so this, in this paper with uh, Nacho Escapa, we sort of, we compiled some Patagonian plant fossils um, in yellow and compared them to the previously published molecular ages. Um, and there's sort of a, there's, there's a clear pattern where about two thirds of the fossils are, are, are significantly older uh, than the pre-existing molecular dates. Um, and that's certainly the case for, uh, for uh, Physalis. These fossils are, you know, 20 million years older than the understanding of, of the whole family had been. And these are derived members of the family. So it suggests that the Solanaceae are a much older group than just the Eocene. Now, a really fun aspect of this, uh, which we tucked into that 2017 paper, um, was some kid science, because we had this idea with my uh, older daughter um, that, you know, why, why are these inflated calyces there? And, you know, and of course, as a geologist, I'm thinking about the ancient lake. Um, so, you know, presumably they floated out into the lake <laughs> with their little calyces as, as, uh, as um, life preservers, and then eventually sank. Otherwise, we would never see them as fossils because they're so low biomass. They have to get out into the lake and sink. So we did a whole lot of um, informal experiments, poking holes in them, not poking holes in them as a control. The ones with holes in the calyx sank a lot faster. <clears throat> we did drip experiments to see if the berries stayed dry inside because it's a rainforest, right? So here's our little sink rainforest. And, um, and the berry does stay dry in there. And, and they do float and they could stay floating for weeks. Um, so this was a lot of fun. And this is my daughter's first publication, of course. Uh, she's at age, uh, at age, what, 13. She was, uh, she, she, got, she got into an acknowledgement in a science paper. So that's a lot of fun. But this, this actually creates a plausible model for some of them. There, there are a lot of functions of the calyx, but this seemed to be some of them, possibly. And it makes sense in terms of the ancient rainforest environment. Yeah, so going back, um, here we have this tomatillo from 50 million years ago in Patagonia that's part of Gondwana. So the oldest evidence for Solanaceae is from South America, except that South America isn't South America yet. It's still part of Gondwana. Um, so at least some dispersals are, are probably not necessary. We want to relate South American and Asian Solanaceae um, you know, the, the land route that we see in photocarps, uh, oricarian conifers, cupressaceae, uh, phagaceae, myrtaceae, the same, the same plants that associate with these fossil timotillos, you know, it's very, very likely that there's some kind of a Southern connection to Australia and, and to Southeast Asia that's related to the, that, that's related to these fossils. We don't know what it is yet. We need to know a lot more. Um, you know, and this is sort of another problem in paleontology. You do a huge amount of work. You collect 8,000 fossils. Three of them are Solanaceae. <laughs> and then, you know, what does that even mean? That's still just one data point on a map, you know, what's going on everywhere. So, you know, we're starting to see evidence of more Solanaceae fossils emerging at meetings from, di from different parts of the world. And of course, we know that around this time, we do know not long after this, there were Solanaceae in Europe. That's well published. Um, so it seems pretty likely Solanaceae are pretty old and um, you know, had gotten around the world before this time. Now, this doesn't preclude diversification of physalides and Gondwan in South America and then post Gondwan in South America. There's just a whole lot we don't know. But it, it creates some very interesting questions and that's really what makes it fun. So for conclusions one, we have two species of crown group physalide Solanaceae that grew in an ancient rainforest through an ancient rainforest through time of, um, just moving the, my video out of the way, of Gondwana and Patagonia 52.2 million years ago, the derived fossils indica indicate that Solanaceae 
had diversified well before Final Gondwan and break up and continued to do so afterwards. I mean, there's a tremendous radiation of Physalide Solanaceae. Some of it undoubtedly occurred in the Andes, the Andean cloud forests, in the arid biomes that developed much later in the Cenozoic. All of that also happened. But you know, the, the group has a pretty old history. Um, they're also the old, still the oldest Solanaceae known, several times older than prior molecular age estimates. This fits a pattern that's been established in many other Patagonian plant fossils and also in other fossil discoveries. So we just saw uh, uh, Kina Tang, Brian Atkinson published these sensational Cretaceous fossils of Ceratophytalum and the Cunoniaceae. Uh, you know, no and they're from Washington State. So they're from a time and place where no one expected them. Most fossils are still, are still on the ground. That's really the bottom line here. We don't know, there's, there's so much that we don't know. South America's importance in early Solanaceae evolution is definitely affirmed here, but it's a more complex story. It was part of Gondwana before it existed as an isolated continent. This actually supports um, some older ideas as one reviewer reminded us. Raven and Axelrod in 1974 said this, that there, were Gondwanan, there was Gondwanan interchange between South America and Australia. Believe it or not, they said this in 1974 without any fossils. The ancient Visalides were part of a rich biota of Paleoantarctic, or just a few fossils that were from Europe. The ancient Visalides were part of a rich biota of Paleoantarctic rainforest lineages, many with strong biogeographic affinities to the modern West Pacific. Um, oops, sorry, I'm hyperactive with the arrow here. The inflated calyx syndrome novelty is of interest to a lot of you, I know. It appears in many Solanaceae clades. It's old. It's been around for a long time, and this is a derived group. This implies that the Eocene world had a, you know, had a lot of these diverse solanaceous reproductive structures that, that we all love and that uh, allow us to set up the evolution of this group in such an interesting way. So probably, I, I expect that over time, again, you know, 8,000 fossils gives you th three solanaceae, but over time, um, I, I predict that we'll find more amazing solanaceous reproductive structures around the world. The functions of the inflated calyx are many, but they appear to include uh, preventing the wetting of the berry and enabling dispersal via flotation. These would have been ideal adaptations in the Eocene lakeside rainforest environment, um, offering some clues to the origins of the, of the syndrome. And of course, um, all of us who know solanaceae know that when we're eating them, how tasty they are. This is a pretty big fossil berry. It strongly suggests vertebrate mutualisms um, are occurring. And it's not the only evidence. We also have acorns of phagaceae and, and quite a number of other large fruits. Uh, we also have fossil mammals from a site not far away from here, quite a lot of them. Um, the most important message is get out there and dig as soon as, uh, as soon as world conditions permit us again. Nearly all fossils are still in the ground. And here's some more pages from the children's book. This is really, uh, it's in that Rebecca is writing, uh, just a little preview. Really, this would have been much better than my talk. How do we know it happened? How do we know? Let's see the evidence. So this is, we're planning to have this in three languages. Um, and we have a, a Boca kid from Argentina and a girl from Indonesia. The story begins with a group of scientists going on a field trip in Patagonia, and you can sort of see the rest. Pro tip, deserts are great places to look for fossils, jungles are not. Too bad for the rainforest plants, but good for us guanacos, and so on. So uh, thank you from, uh, from all of us uh, involved in this. And it's a very deep team. This is just one, this is one piece of, a, of an ongoing project. But you know, th thank you to the National Science Foundation and all our um, other partners, especially the Conocet and um, other funders of this work and just uh, a lot of folks. And thank you, I've really enjoyed, you know, I'm sort of uh, an accidental visitor to Solanaceae and I've met a lot of really great people, uh, some of whom are out there listening right now uh, through this project. And I think you have a great community in Solanaceae and I'm, I'm honored to have been a, at least a temporary visitor to it. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you, Peter. Was great. There is a lot of comments. That is very cool talk and very very complete. So Sandy has a question. So oh, Peter, that was amazing. That was just amazing. I want to go fossil hunting now. I'm just desperate to go Please. fossil hunting. Yeah, you so, are. <laughs> so what do you think? I think it's really cool this idea that the inflated calyx syndrome is really ancient. So do you think the fact that it it happens kind of in a lot of different places? 
but it but it's not expressed very much. Do you think that means that the kind of that there are other sort of syndromes that we might not recognize as Solanaceae, which are out there as fossils that may be Solanaceae, but it's just been lost? I think it's really likely. I mean, there's there there are so many fossils in museums. And really these Solanaceae, at least the first one was a fossil in a museum because we didn't know what to do with it for 15 years. And uh, it was lost in this huge crush of 8,000 fossils, of course, but that's the story everywhere. Uh, you know, I, I think that we should be, I think there are a lot of treasuries just sitting in collections right there in your museum, Sandy, so. Yeah, probably, probably. I mean, that's probably true. Probably not, probably not from Argentina. But I was just wondering if there are some, you know, because we you recognize this is Solanaceae based on a set of characteristics which are present in extant taxa. Mm -hmm. But maybe there's groups of characteristics which are not present in extant taxa that are Solanaceae that we just wouldn't recognize as Solanaceae. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, it's very, it's very likely. That's a very common story in Pelabani that we have stem diversification and we and we, you know that we don't have the features to recognize what stem we're on. And this is a problem in angiosperms as a whole, of course, because the oldest angiosperm, you know, the conundrum, the oldest angiosperm fossils are from 135 million years ago. And, you know, but cladistically they should go back to the Paleozoic. So that suggests that there are lots and lots of angiosperms that probably are sitting in museums. Missing we, we, bits, we, missing, missing character combinations. I think that's really, I, that's super exciting because yeah. that then, ties it into the story of all that changing environment and what made it and what didn't, which I think is fascinating. Oh, yeah. fantastic talk. Thank you so much. Oh, it's nice to see you. Thank you, Sandy. Now we have a question of Richard Olmsted. Hi, Dick, how are you? Good, that was a fabulous talk. You know, I followed the Solanaceae work and just bits and drabs of your other stuff. So it was really great to see it all put together. But one of the questions that raised in my mind, you did that great review of all of these groups that you find fossils of in Patagonia that are now predominantly Southeast Asian and Australasian, mm -hmm. and yet here is this physaloid. It's the same right. age, but it isn't there, essentially okay. isn't there. You know, it's the, the whole physaloid clade is predominantly, almost one could say pretty much exclusively a new world radiation. Is there something about, I mean, you mentioned a couple of times that the connection between the proto South America and Antarctica was close, but not a physical land connection through much of that time. Is there a differential you think in um, the capability of crossing those uh, narrow straits like that, that would lead to some groups? I think it was mostly trees that you were talking about that mm -hmm. are now Southeast Asian but not other groups that are perhaps herbaceous like Solanaceae uh, being prevented from making that uh, transition. I can't think of anything. The thing about geologic time is there's an awful lot of it and eventually something <laughs> finds a way or just is lucky or unlucky. So you know, if you, the, the mammals make it across. So you, there are connections in the mammals like microbiotheres that are in Antarctica as fossils. And, um, so, you know, over enough time, there's some way that that the plants will move. And we, cer we certainly see this in, with Wallace's line that the plants cross the lines. That was a paper by Lizzie Joyce et al. that did a huge database, and um, you know that's deep water. So it, it's hard it, it, it's hard to point to any one taxon and say this could or could not disperse across this much water of this much depth. But the thing about shallow water is it means that at some time there's exposed land um, when the sea level is changing. So you know, generally, if there's shallow water, that's not considered to be much of a barrier. It, it, it also means there are intermittent, little, little intermittent islands or stepping stones. So I don't, think, I don't think there's much of a barrier at all. Now, I'm not really an expert in this, but uh, you know, Physali astrum, is, isn't that one uh, Asian yeah. genus that, that could fit this scenario? Yeah. Um, well, it, it, it certainly uh, and, 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 of course. Yeah, it seems true that um... I would, you know, that latter one could be explained more readily by a Northern Hemisphere connection. And, but it seems like the uh, Panama gap uh, has been jumped many more times by plants yes. uh, than had been by vertebrates before a land bridge was connected and including many cases of Solanaceae. So, you know, mm -hmm. I, I can't explain it, but it certainly is a, a, a different pattern than you saw with so many other groups. 
Yeah, yeah, the, the Panama, the, the Panama uh, land bridge story is another one where there seem to have been all kinds of stepping stones and different degrees of barriers. And the thing, about, the thing about geology and plates moving is it's awfully slow. So uh, there, you, 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 know, you can't say, it, it's not like dating the rocks where you say, okay, this, this rock, this eruption happened on a Tuesday. Right? We're getting to that point, right? But the, you, know, you can't say that these two land masses separated on a Tuesday. It's, like, it's creaking and crawling over millions of years. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Stacy has her hand up. Yes. Hey, Stacy. Yeah, sorry. I to, oh, and I'm, I'm pointing at my desk. And guess what's on there are my maps of like, I made myself, <laughs> as Rocio knows, this handy. What happens during the geologic, <laughs> across geologic eras? So I can it remember. Sorry, I still don't have it on my face. Um, so, Peter, you, you mentioned really briefly about these caldera lakes, and we had talked briefly about, like, like you just mentioned in our last conversation about sort of Eocene lake floras. And I'm just wondering, you know, how widespread was this caldera lake system, and are the floristic formations around them, I mean, maybe there's just not that kind of fossil record for others of these Eocene caldera lakes, but I just wondered if you could say a little bit more about yeah, there's that. Yeah, there's a whole system of them through time, and they start, uh, they represent a particular phase of uh, arc volcanism that's related to like an early iteration of the Andes, and we call that the Pilkanijeu volcanic belt. Um, there are a bunch of papers on that, of course, and there are some there are a bunch of, um, there are a lot of lake deposits and some of them are better to have good fossils. Uh, so what the, probably the, the, the most famous one that isn't Laguna de Lonco is uh, Rio Pichileifu, which is about 48 million years. That's one of our active sites. We have not found Solanaceae there. Um, another one is just north of the city of Bariloche and it's called uh, Pampa de Jones. And literally the locals say Jones, not Jones, and have not found Solanaceae there. Um, there's another one called Arroyo Chakai. So part of our project is, is exploring a bunch of these. Um, Laguna de Lanco has by far the best preservation and has the most rocks that have fossils. So there's, 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 a, there's a preservational filter as well. I think it's likely that Solanaceae, you know, they survive, obviously survive in South America. They were there. Um, but you, know, you just gotta have to remember how incredibly rare this kind of fossil is. Like people think of dinosaurs as, as, as common fossils, but they were not. Um, but I like to tell my students, if you took every dinosaur fossil that's been identified, not the little chunkosauruses, and spread them out evenly over the whole reign of the dinosaurs, you would have a dinosaur fossil every 50,000 years, one every 50,000 years. And th those have bones. Um, and so it's like, here we're trying to find Solanaceae, these little herbaceous things that are growing under like giant cowrie trees and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, all kind of enormous oracarias and you know, thick stands of eucalyptus, which have like literally tens of thousands of times the biomass. So it's it's kind of it's incredible when they turn up and um, remarkable. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you. Now we have another question of Janet Sullivan. Hi, Janet. It's an honor to meet you. How are you? Hi, nice to meet you too. That was a fantastic talk. Um, Thanks for coming. A lot of a lot of stimulation, intellectual stimulation there, and I'm really excited too about the idea of a children's book um, because I have a grandson, a seven year old grandson, who's very very interested in science and particularly in plant science. So um, and dinosaurs. Okay, I, finish it. Thank so I, you. <laughs> I guess the whole path. <laughs> so make sure we have that reference um, when it's published. Um, I'm wondering. Um, so, and maybe I've missed something in more recent literature, but um, the divergence of the typical fissilis is, it, and we, we, this was brought up a, a minute ago, thought to be um, more in Mexico and maybe like Texas. And so I'm wondering if, why you chose fissilis as the name for the genus for these, maybe it's a it was a predecessor genus of um, to Fissilis and some of the other things because that um, the you know the Fissaliastrum and and um, uh, Alcacengi in Europe you know with that um, inflated fruiting calyx being that connector I'm just wondering why you landed on Fissilis for the genus name for that when it seems like mm. research shows that the 
diverges, the, the molecular clock for Fissilis is much more recent and much further north. Mm -hmm. And this isn't my area. Yeah, it's, entirely more, it's, not, it's entirely the morphological characters. Um, so there are a number, I, I agree that we're not very far away morphologically, especially from Akakenji. But you know, using the, the methods that I showed, scoring, scoring those characters, um, you, you, that's that's where you come out. You come out with uh, with Physalis. So you know we can we can we can do the analyses and we can figure out what genus is the most closely related living genus, and then we can decide should we give it um, or the most similar, I should say, um, both morphologically and phylogenetically in terms of phylogenetic analysis. Um, you know, and then we can ask, you know, does it really belong in that genus, the living genus, or should we give it another name for an extinct genus? The problem mm -hmm. is if you do that, um, you need to diagnose it. You need to say what's different. And here's something that has a whole lot of characters that is not different um, from some of the Physalis species like Angostifolia in particular, I think, Glutinosa perhaps, that you've studied so well. And, uh, so then you don't have a justification for, uh, for, a, for a new name. Now, if we get more information, if we find that, that there are characters that really can't be reconciled with a living genus, you know, we have extinct genera in this flora that do have um, these characters. So it's, so it's entirely, it's entirely character-based. So an example of that kind of a decision was actually the second species, Heinekenii, which has the very dense tertiary veins. The combination mm -hmm. of characters that it has, um, if you include the dense tertiary veins, doesn't exist. And, uh, so, so, you know, we explained in the paper, you know, this is a combination that's new, but we don't see a reason to, we, did, we decided not to make a new genus because do you make a whole genus out of one character? Does that cause more trouble than it's worth? Yeah, just be interesting to see reconciling that with other information um, about divergence of extant um, species. You know, maybe yeah. we'll learn more as... I mean, as a paleontologist, the evidence is... Is what is what we have as fossils, right? Right, right, right. And, you know, that's that, it's my job to to find the fossils and put a, a, number, a date on them. And um, you know, the it's you know if you are if you if you go for, literally from the fossils, then this is a genus that started in Gondwana, made its way north through the Andes, and diversified everywhere it went. It diversified in the cloud forests. It diversified in the drier valleys that emerged in, in the northern Neotropics. It diversified in the new arid diversified in the new arid zones in Mexico. It did, it did that really, really, really well. So all of these things are part of its story, um, but it's also always possible that uh, this this is, uh, you know, this could turn out to be some, it's most likely that this is some, if there's an alternative, the most likely alternative is that this is more related to something in Asia and it's not Physalis. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, going on the evidence we have, yeah, you know, that's, that's the most sensible thing to call it. And um, I agree with you about the water dispersal. I've been tossing mm -hmm. Physalis calices into the streams for 40 years. But, <laughs> <laughs> but also, and they do, the berries stay dry. And I'm not sure how often those calices get opened and, and chomped into by um, frugivores. But the other thing is, um, you know, as you move into drier habitats is wind dispersal, um, yes. that those calices blow along. Yes. Um, the ground, so um, so they do disperse that way. Well, thank you so much. It was really interesting. Great to and talk to you. Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, e e email me, call me. It was really fun to talk more. Okay, and, and thank great. you for all the work that you did that made it possible for us to do ours. Ah, glad it's glad it's been useful. <laughs> Very useful. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. So we have another question from Maria Victoria Gomez. And she says, great work. It was, I was wondering if it's possible to explain the good conservation of the calyx of physalis, of physalis fossils by biochemical composition, lignins? Well, the, the lignins certainly help because they're, you know, plants don't have bones, but they do have, um, you know, they do have xylem, they do have, they do have extremely resistant organic compounds like lignins. So that's part of the answer. Uh, the, I, I don't think there was anything once the harder part to explain is how it got into the lake at all, which flotation is an answer to that. But once it sinks with all the other plant material, um, it's getting preserved the same way. So the standard way that you preserve what we call compression floras, which means that they're getting compressed by all the mud and sand that falls on them, is um, anoxic, uh, anoxic environment, rapid burial, 
Um, th there's there was some, something that's magic about this lake is that it probably had very few scavengers. So there's, we find no bioturbation. Um, we find almost no aquatic life at all. I think it was a dead lake uh, because it's, we, have, we have very acid water, very hot water. It's constantly being shot through with, uh, with volcanic uh, vents and that kind of thing. Uh, there's a diatom in here, still not published, that you can find in Yellowstone Hot Springs, for example. So I think these plants are also benefiting from a, sort of a lack of uh, organisms that would eat them. But yeah, sinking, no scavenging, rapid burial, low oxygen, uh, all the plants are getting preserved that way. And, and of course, uh, the resistant compounds like lignans are, are helping. Okay, thank you, Peter. And now we have a question from Chris Martin. Hey, Chris. Hi, Peter. I'm waving to you from 50 miles away. Can you see yeah, me? Yeah, I can see you. Yeah. <laughs> so just a quick thing, like sort of nuts and bolts. I, I, I think I was, um, I'm one of many folks who really appreciate you sort of doing the comparison between uh, the fossils and the herbarium specimens and looking at how those, even the compression itself kind of lines up, which is just such a cool way to look at it. Um, you talked about uh, paleobotanists documenting everything well enough that basically you could put the fossils back in the ground, but you're also sort of like um, recognizing a, a, a holotype specimen, right? So I, could you just sort of walk through, like if you're going to describe a new taxon based on fossil remnants, what's sort of the process? Is it, is it the fossil that's the type? Is it a set of images? Sort of, could you expand on that sort of idea? Uh, it's, it's very similar. Uh, we follow the same rules as uh, what, what we call neobotanists do, because we're paleobotanists. Uh, so <laughs> we, we select a type specimen, we describe it, we put it in the museum. We follow the same code, the ICBN, uh, the same system of types. Um, now the collections can be held in herbaria. Some herbaria have, do have fossil collections. Um, most herbaria don't. They tend to be kept in the paleobotanical divisions of various museums, um, but they are curated. Uh, they have curators. Um, and they're, they're type specimens in the same sense that as a type specimen of a worm or a, a, of an oak tree or anything you like. There, there's the, a tiny difference in that you don't have isotypes in paleobotany. That is a really important point, Sandy. Yeah, we, we can't duplicate them. They are unique. So, so there's, a, there's, a, there's a few rules that are different, um, but it's basically not that many. The basic principles are all the same and the things the things you have to do when you declare the specimen in a journal are, are exactly the same. Yeah. yeah. So these particular uh, type specimens are um, are at the math museum, which is the official repository for specimens from Chubut province, Argentina. Which is where they should be in their country of origin. We're except giving the one a that I have, Nick Turland and I. Are, <laughs> yeah, on loan, on loan. Which Nick Turland and I are giving a course on nomenclature at the Paleobotanical. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a beautifully approved, properly documented loan from the state, from the city, and the province, and the country of Argentina. Yep. And it's, it will go back on time. But the loan procedures are also similar. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. And I think we don't have any other questions. Uh, I do have one question. Do you think that there are similar lake systems in Antarctica that could be explored for more solanaceous fossils, considering the hypothesis that everything has been um, showing, like uh, connected mm -hmm. during the diversification probably of this particular group? Undoubtedly, there are a lot of them. The problem is all that ice. So you should all go out and, and turn on your cars and just leave them That'll running. Be gone soon. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there, there are. Yeah, we a lot should of look at we should look at Captain Scott's fossils because we have all those Captain <laughs> Scott fossils here, which I don't think anybody's really looked at. Well, uh, uh, yeah, actually, there have been immense uh, for fossils of that age of the uh, Permian and Triassic. There have been huge research programs. Uh, Tom Taylor, Edie Taylor. Um, have been collecting from um, Antarctica from, from that time period for many, many years. Now, are, are any of those, uh, a lot of that stuff is sitting in the basement in Kansas uh, in, the, in the Natural History Museum there, but uh, many, many papers have been published. But the, uh, for this time period, I'm not, I think all the rocks that I know of in Antarctica that have fossils are, are marginal marine. Um, they're not lakes, they're, they're rivers and deltas and things. Um, I think you do need this very special preservation where you have the, 
in the lake, you get the very um, quiet water. Um, it, this kind of thing probably wouldn't last if it was being deposited in a flood or overbank deposit very well. It's possible though. So where else would you go? Where else would you go to find lakes like this? I mean, where would you think? I mean, you know, this one's there, but but is there a way to predict where you might find? Well, there are fossil lakes all over the world. Um, lakes tend to be episodic because they don't. Uh, they're not marine sediments. So geologically, they represent temporary storage. A lake is there, but it's above sea level. So as soon as you as soon as you compromise it, it flushes out and it's gone. Um, but there are a lot of uh, fossil lakes in North America. Um, so if there were, you know, from from the uh, early Eocene, you know, up until you know through the Miocene, there are lots and lots of them. Some are volcanic, some aren't. There's a uh, Florissant, there's Green River, some really famous uh, places. So th those are. Those are good candidates. Um, China has a lot of fossil lakes, including Cretaceous ones. Um, so yeah, there, there, there are quite a few. It's very hard to kind of go out and say, I'm going to find Solanaceae. <laughs> like yeah. it, nobody would ever get funded to go find Solanaceae in, somewhere by digging it up. It's more likely you would find, we, we, we're getting them as bycatch as part of this enormous project where we're doing all these other things. So we're lucky that way. But, um, you know, someone AC were part of that bycatch, but um, you, you probably your best bet is to look at a lot of collections, which I know our CEO has been doing a lot of, just looking, looking through the collections, because there, there's so many fossils. If you look at what people have already collected, there are millions of specimens. Yeah, there are so many fossils in the collection, so that's the best way to find some sort of AC, but yeah, soon. <laughs> <laughs> and Maria Victoria Gomez has another question. Uh, she oh, sorry, says, I don't think I answered the first one. No, I did. Okay. Maria Victoria, can we spe speculate about herbivores that could eat Phasalis at that time? Yes, yes, yes. I'm here. Yeah, I understood your answer. But it was, thank you. <laughs> okay, hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> yeah, I was I was thinking about um is we can we can we speculate about the fact that uh, they are um, probably which are the animals that could eat this these fruits uh, at that time based on on fossils that were also found in the same place? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, you can speculate definitely. It's very one of the, the, the nice thing about insects is that you can actually preserve the the evidence of their feeding. So are the, the the fossil leaves from this place are just jam packed with. Um, with uh, leaf mines with fossil uh, frass in them and leaf galls and chewing. Um, so that's pretty spectacular. We also have insect body fossils. Now these calices don't have insect uh, bite marks on them. Um, but you know, if, if you're gonna talk about what could eat the berry, um, it's a pretty wide range of things. And we have, you know, we found a fossil, we found fossil birds. Um, one of them is a, is a roller uh, bird, potentially it could eat that. Um, and you know, there, are, there are a whole lot of mammals around in this. We don't have them in the lake. They're from slightly younger sediments, but there's quite a variety of functional groups uh, from these, uh, from these uh, mammals. There are bats, uh, for example. There are, uh, there are a bunch of archaic things, uh, gondwanotheres. There's a variety of marsupials. So there are really quite a lot of candidates. I mean, if I was there, I would eat them. <laughs> I don't know any. Thank you very much. There are even turtles. If I was a turtle, I would definitely eat that. <laughs> we, have, we have those in the same sediments as the... You need to try with turtles now. <laughs> Feed it with them. <laughs> with your girl. Thank you, sorry. Oh, thanks so much. Thank you. So I think we don't have any other questions. So with that, we are finishing the seminar. And in two weeks, we have Constanza Mauvesin that she's going to talk about pollination by oil collecting bees and its, in, its implication in floral evolution on the genus Nierenbergia. So with that, thank you very much, Peter. There is a lot of congratulations in the chat. Um, Thanks, everybody. Thank you for that, a great talk. And see you in two weeks. See you, folks.